when I'm writing this stuff, I'm not writing it from the mountaintop with all the answers. I'm writing what I need to hear myself. Hello. Um, wow. Real people. That is both thrilling and horrifying. Um, so my name is Georgia Pritchett. I have written a book called My Mess is a Bit of a Life, uh, which is about the complete shambles I've made of my life. And so I think that's why they invited me here to talk to Matt, because I have questions and I need answers. Um, so today we are going to be talking to this incredible uh, author, man, human, mammal, uh, who writes fiction and non-fiction for adults and children. Um, he's sold more than three million books worldwide. Uh, crikey. Um, and today I'll be talking to him about his latest book, The Fantastic Comfort Book. So uh, just to let you, Matt, and Anna, and everyone here and everyone at home know, um, what I'm going to do is start with some questions about Matt, the person. I'm going to channel my inner Emily Maitlis and ask him a series of quickfire, penetrating, taxing questions um, so we can get to know him better. Um, prepare to sweat, Matt, unless, like Prince Andrew, you don't do that. Um, and then after that, we're going to be talking about the comfort book. And then you uh, in the audience here live can ask questions, and also people at home can ask questions. So, ready? I'm ready. OK, great. Hello, everybody. Yes, here's Matt. Oh, my um, god, my face is so big. <laughs> <laughs> I, in case it seems weird, Matt is here for me. I realize okay. he's also looking at the back of my head. So this yeah. is going to be pretty serious stuff. What voice do you talk to your dog in? Uh, uh, quite aristocratic, sort of, yeah, you know, um, yeah, not Prince Andrew, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, she, she, she's a Maltese terrier, so um, she's from a long line of uh, Maltese aristocratic dogs, because they were the original lap dogs for the uh, royal family of Malta. Apparently, that's, that's the origin story of right. Maltese Terriers. Anyway, yeah, that's not okay. very quick fire. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what voice does she answer you in? We the same. We you know, it's, okay. it's just aristocratic communication. She's really very um, civilised with human beings. It's just other dogs, particularly larger, uh, any, any larger mammal, mammal or... Um, High vis, you know, workmen in high vis jackets. She goes absolutely wild if she sees one of those. Oh, really? Because it's, it, it's just an unnatural thing. Uh, or, or bin bags or floating carry bags. Yeah. Yeah. All of that. She she goes. Yeah. She turns a little bit um, angry. But to to humans, she she talks in a really civilized kind of. Uh, I'm not going to do the voice, but okay. It's very... Yeah. <laughs> we'll let you get away with that. What is the emoji you most commonly use? Well, for years, I was a real emoji snob, and I didn't use many emojis. Um, and now, probably because I've spent too long on Instagram, I use a lot of emojis. Um, I'd say green heart. I don't know, it's boring, but it's the one I probably use the most, because um, it's just always there in my thing. So I find the red heart a little bit cliched, so I, I go for a green heart, which okay. seems less a romantic heart and more a sort of, like, I don't know, a, a sort of softer, caring, less uh, creepy heart. OK. <laughs> um, what's your signature dish that you cook? Indonesian satay, um, vegan satay. Yeah, I'm being so bright in here, aren't I? But um, there's, a great, there's a great duo of chefs. They're, they're twin brothers. They're from Ireland, and they're called The Happy Pair. And their cookbook, or cookbooks, plural, got me through um, lockdown. And I was doing more cooking than usual. And the best recipe, I've got this really simple Indonesian satay. And it's great because you put loads of peanut butter, almond butter, or, you know, loads of um, 
my favourite things in it, and it's super spicy and it's super easy. And it, and it sounds disgusting when you're putting loads of peanut butter in it, but it just really <laughs> works and, it, and it, it, it's good. So that's my signature um, one. I'll probably do more than others. Very good. And what is the most overworn item in your wardrobe? Um, I should say this because it's like, I've just realised it's stained, so you can probably <laughs> see. <laughs> but it's not this because the most overused items have holes in them because when I'm writing, I didn't realise I did this for years, but when I'm writing, I do that. I go like that. <laughs> so I'm on my laptop. Oh. And I, I, I oh. bite my, um, I eat my own clothes. I'll have to, yeah, I'll try And this isn't, this isn't that well eaten. This is <laughs> Do you have a go-to karaoke song? <laughs> I am, we, I, I don't do karaoke in public. We have a, there's a karaoke game we've got, and we did it with an extended family um, just before COVID. And um, it's not, I don't do it enough to have a standard one, but I think it was Living on a Prayer. I tried, and <laughs> I, I, and I heard it back, and I'm like the world's worst um, John Bon Jovi impersonator. <laughs> I won't say that. Do you have a nickname or nicknames? Uh, well, from my children, but they're not all um, repeatable. <laughs> but um, what do I have? Yeah, no, I suppose my kids, my daughter calls me D a lot just because it's dad. I, I don't really have nicknames. Um, I have insults, but that's from Twitter. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, we no, won't. I'm we won't to think. There. Matilda Haggis, I used to have for years, oh. but that's because Matt Haig, Matilda Haggis. Oh, that's I don't, no, I don't really have any. Um, I do, but I, I can't think of them. But I, I, we'll, me, we'll think of you. Ne next one. Um, when was the last time you punched the air, either literally or metaphorically? <sighs> well, it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, recently. I sh uh, we went actually to Scotland, to the Highlands, and I had this really um, beautiful moment in uh, Plockton, which is in Westeros in the Highlands on the west coast, um, and yet yeah, not far from Skye. And it wasn't a triumphant moment really, but we'd gone to a restaurant and we were late for the restaurant, and um, it was slight rain, just mild drizzle. And um, we were too late for a restaurant, so they'd given our table away to somewhere else. And we just went along um, to the chip shop and got some chips and sat on the beach in the drizzle as a family and ate them. And it just seemed such a perfect moment. And it was literally to the day, 22 years from when I'd um, first gone to the doctors about having a nervous breakdown 22 years ago, being prescribed diazepam 22 years ago. And I was just had a, a feeling that I was in a future that just felt like a dream and it was just so wonderful. And it was just eating these sort of perfect, light golden um, chips mm. in, in the drizzle in um, the Highlands. And it was, yeah, not maybe an air punch, but it was just that moment of like, yeah. things feeling just right you know yeah. when something just feels naturally perfect yeah fantastic and lastly before we talk about your book the comfort book what is your comfort book oh really i have comfort books i have lots of them if I, the one that literally came into my head there was the house at pooh corner i think the winnie the pooh books are the ultimate comfort books and i think having seen this sort of was it what was the biopic was it Christopher Robin? Uh, oh. I don't know. There was, was a biopic or a couple of biopics recently. And A.A. Milne wrote um, about Winnie the Pooh when he was effectively going through post-traumatic um, stress. I mean, his shell shock. He, he, he was um, back in England, in Sussex, and he was going through all this sort of mental stuff, creating the most whimsical, um, sentimental, timeless characters and adventures and I see the Winnie the Pooh books I sometimes joke about it but I, they are you know there's been a book that book hasn't there, the Tower of Pooh about a sort of um, 
spiritual element to it, but I also see them as sort of self-help books and mental health books. Like you could actually break down the characters in Winnie the Pooh and see them representing different um, conditions. So you'd have like Tigger, who's hyperactive. You'd have um, Eeyore, obviously depressed. You'd have Anxious um, Piglet. <laughs> you have Confused Pooh and you have Christopher Robin who's hallucinating the whole experience. <laughs> and, and so, so I, I, and I, I just, I, I can remember reading actually at the age of 24, I'd obviously read them as a child, but I re remember being back in my bedroom, my childhood bedroom at the age of 24, very ill, and not being able to read much. But one of the things I could actually read was um, Winnie the Pooh. But I mean, I've got lots of others. There's a great book called um, When Things Fall Apart by, an American writer, Buddhist writer, I'm not Buddhist, but it, it gave me a lot of comfort called, yeah, When Things Fall Apart, and that's a great book. It's got a terrible, terrible cover, like the worst kind of sort of self-help cover from the 90s, but it actually contains a lot, of, um, a lot of great stuff about dealing with uncertainty and about how in the West we're really bad at seeing the complete picture. So anything less than perfect, any, any type of suffering or pain, we just see that as meaning we're a failure or life's a failure. And it's a great um, counterbalance to that as well. So she's great as well, Pima, mm. Pima Shofra. Fantastic. Okay, so um, obviously today we're pretty much 18 months into a global pandemic and there's horrifying stories on the news and the world feels more divided than ever. So I thought a good way to start might be for you to read a section from your book called We Have More In Common Than You Think. Yes. Do you have the page number there? Yes. I have book, book here, don't my <laughs> 208. Page. Oh, yes. I've got it. I've got it. Came to us. My chapters, as you know, are all super short, so this is um, not going to be that long a reading. We have more in common than we think. It's easy to hate everyone these days. It's easy to go on the internet or switch on the news and feel despair. It's easy to find reasons to be angry. We have social media apps whose very business model depends on our ongoing capacity for fury and frustration. So easy to be surrounded so entirely by a singular view that almost anyone without that view becomes alien. But we can look at the world through more than one lens. If we look at people through the lens of emotion, at the feelings that drive opinions rather than the opinions themselves, it's easy to see the things we share the hopes, the fears, the loves, insecurities, longings, doubts, and dreams. Other people can be wrong, and we can be wrong, and that is another thing we have in common. The capacity for fucking up, and for forgiving, and for forgiving. That was a bad ending. For forgiving, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, and I think it's so true that it's so much easier to feel compassion uh, and so much more rewarding to feel compassion than hatred. Um, and what's interesting is that it's easier to feel compassion for other people than for ourselves. But you also speak in your book about uh, the need to have compassion for ourselves, which is so much harder. Um, could you read the very first page of your book, which is so wonderful? It's called Baby. Yeah. Um, imagine yourself as a baby. You would look at that baby and think they lacked nothing. That baby came complete. Their value was innate from their first breath. Their value did not depend on external things like wealth or appearance or politics or popularity. It was the infinite value of a human life. And that value stays with us. Even as it becomes easier to forget it, we stay precisely as alive and precisely as human as we were the day we were born. The only thing we need is to exist and to hope. I, I'm really um, self-conscious doing readings now because I had to do the audio book um, for the comfort book. And normally they get someone, um, you know, they get a fancy actor to read the audio books. Like, um, I, I was very lucky. We had Kerry Mulligan do the audio book for um, the Midnight Library and she was brilliant and obviously everyone loved that. And um, I get some funny comments about the audiobook uh, for the comfort book. Like, so the most recent one was, I think it was a three-star review, and they said, um, yeah, 
it, it, it was good. I mean, he did. He, he, it was a good effort. His reading was a good effort. I mean, he's obviously no Stephen Fry, but it was a, it was a good effort. And so all I hear, whatever I'm reading about how about self acceptance or whatever, all I'm hearing in my own head is he's no Stephen Fry. <laughs> I think three stars is pretty good. I read a one-star a one star review for Jane Austen the other day, and it said, it's just people visiting each other's houses. <laughs> True. Um, but I loved what you said about uh, thinking of ourselves as babies, because I travelled up here on the train next to a baby, and uh, by the end of the journey, the entire carriage was just cooing and ooing at this baby and, and sort of saying how amazing and great and lovely he was. And, you know, he did nothing. He just sat there. Uh, and everyone, yeah. and, I, and, I, and that relates to something you say later in your book uh, about value being innate. Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, no, it's something I struggle with. And, you know, because I struggled as a young person with, with massive low self-esteem, social anxiety, shyness. I mean, at school, I... Um, I, you know, it, it was never diagnosed until much later on, but I had all kinds of issues and anxiety issues, and it was all basically at the heart of it was um, low self-esteem and an ability that I wasn't worth it. And I can remember, like, when I was suicidal, I was suicidal primarily because I was in a lot of pain and I didn't know how to go on living. But I think beyond that, beneath that pain, was this idea that I was just sort of, like, taking up space I didn't deserve you know to be here and, and and this you know this idea I feel like almost our whole economy and our whole sort of modern societies are almost designed I mean not consciously not in a conspiracy theory way but they're sort of unconsciously designed to make us feel um bad about ourselves I mean because you know if we feel contentment with what we have then where is that need to keep purchasing things, because most of us in, uh, in the UK, you know, we have shelter, we have food, uh, we have the basics that you actually need to survive. So then, to keep the economy going and to keep the consumerist economy going, you're fed um, insecurities all the time, you have new problems that you didn't know you have. I can remember my first visit ever to California this woman from outside, this very nice, sweet um, woman outside this shop was uh, brought me in, in, into this shop and told me that she had this solution to my face. And I said, oh, like, what's the matter with my face? And she said, oh, you know, and then she pointed out all these lines I'd never seen on my face and uh, all these products that can magically take them out and about how all women don't like men with these lines on their face or whatever it was. And I thought, I've literally... I've never worried about this in my life before. Now, now you've just given me a load of insecurities <laughs> to sell me this sort of $80 miracle cream or whatever. And it's like, but that's a, an obvious example. But I think in, in um, less obvious ways, we're always sold worry and doubt and, uh, and low self-esteem. You know, uh, politicians obviously uh, make us fear things to, to, to then vote for them as the solution. Um, you know, the beauty industry, which is a 24 billion industry, which is primarily historically targeted women, but increasingly men too, is, is this, uh, you know, it, it's built on insecurity. Um, you know, gyms, everything, you know, we're encouraged to feel self-conscious of, of our bodies in ways we never had. So yeah, I feel like still all of us, even the most sort of insecure or self-conscious, we all know the intrinsic value of a baby and we all were that baby and we are still this human life form and so, uh, yeah, I, I thought I'd start in the most um, sentimental uh, way possible and to try and get people to s remind themselves of, of their intrinsic um, baby self. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. And I, I mean, I think of myself as an accomplished warrior. I feel I've got everything <laughs> covered. Um, but recently, when I was in the States, a woman came up to me and offered me anti-aging cream. And as I was saying, yes, I would like that, she said, for your vagina. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. OK. Well, that's one, that's one worry I don't have. Yeah, you're... You don't know how lucky you are. <laughs> yes. Male privilege right there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I didn't 
by any, because on an average week, more people see my face. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, now, do you remember on the Muppets, those two old men in the balcony, uh, Statler and Waldorf? Yes. I think a lot of us have little miniature ones of those in our brains just heckling us and trolling us all the time. And we give ourselves a really hard time about everything we do. But you've got several things to say that are really helpful about self-worth. Um, one is that your self-worth is not found in the minds of other people. And I just wanted to check if you're sure about that, because I've been looking very hard in the minds of other people for my self-worth. So, Yeah, so have I. That's the thing. You know, when I'm writing this stuff, I'm not writing it from a mountaintop with all the answers. I'm writing what I need to hear myself. So I am someone who has been totally neurotic and totally worried about what people think about me for most of my life. And certainly... Being a writer is no cure for that because you're, you, you, you have everyone's opinion of you and it's suddenly there, it's on Amazon or it's on social media. And the temptation to search what people are saying about you, I have found probably is, uh, you know, an admission of total vanity, but I have found it so hard to resist that sometimes because very often you get a lovely little dopamine hit of people saying very nice things about you and you know if you're having a low day you think oh that's nice I've changed someone's life, changed someone's life or they really like my book or something I and mean, then you feel good about yourself but then as soon as you start to get into that cycle of needing those little dopamine hits you're, you're literally placing your sense of self-worth on like, a, I don't know, like a stocks and shares, stock market of, um, of anything, you know, the ups and downs. So then if you, if you then have, you know, say something wrong on Twitter or, you, 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 some, so, you know, someone has a horrendous opinion of you, then all of a sudden you, you've exercised that muscle in your brain, um, not literal muscle, but you, you've exercised that um, process of taking it in and absorbing it. And then you're absorbing the bad stuff too. So I think it... For me, it's more important sometimes to just sort of like be able to sort of listen to stuff about you because you can't really avoid that sometimes when you've written like 22 books or whatever. You know, there's always people who've got an opinion. But to actually be very grateful for the good stuff, obviously, but not to actually feel like you need it. You know, to actually realise you don't need to... You know, you can have a year off writing books without having to hear nice things. You can, you, you can The real you isn't that. It's not, it's not found in a nice comment in a, a newspaper review or something. Mm. And so being a writer sends you into that world, doesn't it? And you know that now because you, you, you've had your sort of first um, public um, book out there as we were talking before. And yeah, it can drive you a bit crazy. So I'm telling myself what I need to hear. But I sort of know deep down, you know, it's not found, you know, we, I, 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 the comfort book is very influenced by um, the Stoics because um, I'm not really a natural Stoic at all, but I, I'm, I've had a lot of comfort from reading um, people like Seneca, um, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius. Epictetus uh, was the most fascinating of all the old ancient um, Stoic philosophers because he wasn't, unlike Marcus Aurelius, he wasn't an emperor in, you know, literally the most powerful man in the world in Marcus Aurelius' case. Epictetus was... Um, a slave. Um, he was uh, handicapped. I mean, they don't really know the nature of his ailment. Some people think he had his leg broken as a child and um, he was in pain his whole life. And yeah, no one really knows, but they know he was in pain. And he, yet he came up with this philosophy about how you don't, you never control external things. You only control your response to external things. So um, I feel like that, that's the heart of stoicism. And it's still today, you know, that's the heart of, I don't know, CBT uh, type of therapy is the heart of a lot of uh, modern thinking too. So it's a sort of philosophy that's lasted a good two millennia. Mm -hmm. But it is hard to get to that state, you know, and it overlaps with Buddhism as well, where you actually realise it doesn't, change anything what people are saying about you doesn't actually um change anything but i i you know i i i grew up in a way where it's sort of like i was very conscious of other people's 
opinions. So a lot of it is just being very conscious of that self-consciousness and trying to sort of unpack that. And I wouldn't say I'm there. I'm definitely not in a state of nirvana about it. I do still worry about what people think of me a little bit, but it doesn't get in in the way it used to completely. There's a kind of distance. You have to have a kind of distance um, if you're out there in the world and people have opinions. You have to sort of like, you know, roll with the punches and realize it doesn't matter, you know. You, and I think it helps actually in a weird way. The more books you write, you see that. Because I've written all kinds of things and had all kinds of opinions. I've gone from being a certain type of writer to another type of writer to being a children's writer. Um, I mean, I, there used to be a joke about like in my first books that no, no one read. Um, there's a book called The Possession of Mr. Cave, which is a very bleak book. And people used to talk all the time about how um, depressing I was as a writer. And they used to criticize me for that. Now I get criticized that I'm all just optimism and, uh, you know, <laughs> sentimentality. So it's like, you know, and it's like, I'm literally, I'm not really any different to, to that person. You know, it, it, we all have many sides, but people like to sort of see you as this one thing in any moment. And the other thing is why, you know, if we wouldn't go to that person to ask them advice on any other thing, why are we taking their criticism to heart you know the one thing we do know more more than they do is our own selves and our own thoughts so why do we take that's what I try and um mm. and I love and... what you say as well that you're more than a bad comment or more than a bad day or a bad week or you know so many of us I think have had a bad year C can you say a bit more about that about it when you're in those really difficult dark times sort of learning to think that you're more than that feeling. Yeah. Well, I mean, that feeling nearly killed me. Um, it literally, I know it sounds melodramatic, but, you know, that's the only feeling I had when I was 24, 25, that feeling that I wasn't, you know, I was never going to get out of that um, moment. I was, I was, I was, um, I'd fallen so hard into depression, breakdown, permanent state of fear just horrible feelings that I still haven't learned to partic you know totally articulate what I was feeling because some of it's kind of like wordless stuff but I was feeling so bad um that and I didn't know how I'd got into that mess there was no inciting incident there was no death there was no one easy trigger point that I can say that caused it because I didn't know how I'd got into this thing I thought I'm going to have this feeling forever I'm going to literally have to live with it, with this state forever. And um, obviously that wasn't true. Um, you know, the, the, the moment when you're suicidal, um, almost by definition, tends to be the lowest moment. And you're not born suicidal. You, you've got memories of a different time before and you, you then somehow, to survive, you have to have faith in a future self that will be different. I'm not denying the existence of chronic conditions. I'm not denying that people don't have depression forever or anxiety forever. I'll always have anxiety to some degree. Um, I'll possibly, you know, have future panic attacks, future bouts of depression. It's not like gone. It's not a miracle, it's gone. But I think the reason I'm not suicidal anymore is, when you hold on through that moment, you, you, you see enough fluctuation. Mm. Um, and part of that fluctuation is the feelings inside you and part of it's the reaction to those feelings. And you realize there will be different versions of you. And I think the thing that had kept me ill for so long initially with my first sort of breakdown was the fact that I didn't, um, I, I didn't think I'd get out of it. Whereas now, if I have a bout of depression, and I haven't touched wood, um, been properly depressed for quite a while. But when I do, it's shorter. It's like a three-week mm. um, period of depression. And it's because I've developed enough of an inner, an inner voice um, to, to sort of be my own therapist, I suppose, to actually say, well, hold on, you've thought that before. You've thought that before. You know, Because depression has a way of playing tricks. It will say, well, this time it could be different. This time you know, this feels worse than it's ever done. This time, you know, it always does, it says this time's different. Um, but 
you get to a point where you realize actually just it saying this time is different is actually familiar to all the other times it's said that this is going to be the worst time of your life and you'll never survive and so the more times you you get ill the more times you get better um sometimes with, with depression and anxiety you know because when you have had a thousand panic attacks you kind of have got a phd in panic attacks you, yeah. you you understand it so much better but like the first time i had a panic attack i didn't even know i was having a panic attack i thought i was having a heart attack or uh, and i thought i was like imminently going to die and my heart was racing and, uh, and um, my head was feeling strange and my body and everything it felt very physical by the thousandth panic attack you realize you the the way you used to handle panic attacks was the exact best way to keep panic attacks going which was you know to just fear them more, try and run away from them, you know, uh, yeah. do that. You know, now, it doesn't work for everyone, but now, um, if I can, if I'm on my own, I'll just lie down on the floor. If I'm at home, I'd lie down at the floor and, and pretend I want a panic attack. <laughs> yeah. I, don't obvi- I don't want a panic attack, but I pretend I want it almost as like a test. Like, yeah. how will I react to this? Yeah. And the last thing a panic attack wants is to be wanted. <laughs> you know, fear doesn't want to be invited yeah. in. Um, because then you sort of suddenly stop feeling. So you gradually learn. Um, I don't know. I don't know where this question and answer started off. But where I've got to. <laughs> well, I was, but, um, I was you going... gradually you gradually learn how to um, deal with things uh, better. And that idea of a feeling being um, transient um, is scientifically true. But it's also very a very therapeutic thing to remember that you you stay alive for other people but those other people aren't real people external to you they're other versions of yourself mm. there, there be other people who you can't see but you kind of have to have faith in that will be there that will 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 still be some version of you but they won't be this suicidal yeah. version of you. yeah i love that in your book i mean and you've demonstrated it really well that you you stay for, for future versions of yourself. For example, the you sit eating chips in the rain yeah. in Scotland. Yeah, uh, Scotland. You know, who was so grateful that you, that you held on. Um, uh, now, there's, related to this, there's a wonderful quote um, in your book, the, which is, no man ever steps in the same river twice. It's a different man and it's a different river. Um, and that's sort of leading on from what you were just talking about, different versions of ourselves. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I came across that quote actually last year on a podcast because um, I definitely didn't study uh, philosophy or classics at university. I did English and history and was quite, I, I didn't, I, I'd never heard of um, that philosopher Heraclitus. Um, but then last year, um, during the first lockdown, I started listening to this um, f- very basic, um, but, but very good introduction to philosophy called Philosophize This by an American guy whose name I've forgotten. But anyway, um, in one of the early episodes, he was talking about Heraclitus and Heraclitus said that quote about the river and no man stepping into the same river twice and how it fit with his worldview of flux and change and how the universe was this, um, Thing in permanent motion who was the first person to sort of think of life in that way and I love that idea about not stepping in the same river river twice because not only um do you change but the river changes so you know the water's in permanent motion so life's in permanent motion so you're never going to do the exact same thing again because that exact same thing again will in some way at some sort of atomic level will, will be a different thing and also you'll be a different thing so I find that comforting because um, yeah I, I find the idea of change comforting I just find it um, very comforting because I used to when I was ill I can remember can you remember that um, U2 song Stuck in a Moment um, I was, it was a, a, a song, and, it, and it's quite a good U2 song but I that song used to torment me about being stuck in a moment um, forever because it felt like I was having the same panic attack for about three years and I couldn't get out of it. And so that song used to torment me about being stuck in a moment. And, and so any kind of philosophy that's the opposite of that, I'm not blaming you two for my breakdown, by the way. <laughs> I'm not putting it all on Bono. 
<laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it just make it just sort of uh, liberates me. And the older you get, the, you know, there's not a million advantages to our aging, but you do start to realise that, um, that that is essentially what life is. It's change. You don't ever know the future. Obviously, you don't know the future, but you don't really know who you will be in the future. <laughs> um, I think when you're younger and you're in your twenties, you imagine there's this permanent adult you that will stay and then you realize you become different adults with different life experiences whether you become a parent or not whether you meet someone or not what relationships you have um you know there's a lot of research nowadays into neuroplasticity mm -hmm. where uh, it, it's normally done in the context of sort of like alzheimer's and stuff but it applies across the whole mental health spectrum because uh, neuroplasticity is real our brains do change molecular structure and shape through our experiences and interactions so in a very sort of scientific way we are literally becoming slightly different people all the time and, and yeah. we, we 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 can have some say over that you know whether you believe properly in free will or not we can have you know we can feel like we have some um power over that you know we can learn new musical instruments we can do different things we can we can train ourselves to react to things differently mm. um and I find that in itself a comforting idea that, you know, I, I, I'm not totally helpless. And my uh, one gripe, I suppose, I have with um, a lot of the sort of modern mental health conversation is that often it almost positions us as these sort of powerless uh, beings who, you know, because of where we are in society or our position or whatever, everything happens to us. And there is a truth to that. You know, we are all creatures of context and creatures of background and where we grew up and um, all of that and our identity and everything. But actually when you're in depression, sometimes you need to know, you can't just wait to, for society to fix itself. Because mm. if you're sitting there waiting for society to fix yourself, you know, you'll be waiting like forever. So when you're actually individually ill in that moment, you need to feel a little bit of um, self-empowerment or, you know, an ability um, to change your mind about something or to do something um, for yourself. So I think we need a bit of balance between, you know, between it's all society's fault and, you know, there are things... And it's not about self-blame, but there are things that are within our power to sort of change the situation sometimes. Yeah. Now, one of my favourite parts of the book is a section called Caterpillar Soup. Would you mind reading that? It's page 183. Yeah. OK. On the theme of change, I suppose, caterpillars. Um, in the dark cocoon, a... Sorry, I'll start again. In the dark cocoon, a caterpillar falls apart. I've got my Stephen Fry voice going on. It, dis it disintegrates in its own enzymes. It becomes liquid, mush, caterpillar soup. And then slowly it is reborn a butterfly. Cocoons aren't a cosy, quiet resting place. Cocoons must feel a pretty horrendous place for a caterpillar. Yet the caterpillar's fate has proven a great metaphor for our, our own misfortunes and struggles. The greatest changes stem from the darkest experiences. We fall apart to become new. We go through the dark to fly in the sun. Now, I love that so much. And um, I wonder if we should rename depression caterpillar soup or something, because, um, I've, you know, you talk a lot in the book about um, the power of words. And uh, I think if we found other words or phrases that could destigmatize mental health issues, that would be great. And I will sort of think I've got like a dark overlord beaver who chews my intestines and I've got a Godzilla who stomps all over my inner Tokyo. But are there ways that you sort of um, yeah. create to understand how you're feeling or sort of make it feel more familiar or less frightening? Yeah, I also think that's important as well because we use words like depression and anxiety and panic attack and all that stuff all the time in contexts where we're not meaning depression and anxiety and a panic attack. So I feel like, and it always feels so subjective and individual, your own experience. So I do find, um, I mean, I probably overdo the metaphors, but I do find metaphors so 
useful, especially na nature metaphors, because um, it's a way of visualizing the invisible, but very keenly felt. So yeah, um, I went to town on my caterpillars and butterflies and <laughs> rainbows. <laughs> I love that. And, and just, we're going to open up uh, to questions from the audience soon, but I was really interested to read in your book that Maya Angelou um, didn't speak for five years. I didn't know that. And I didn't speak for a couple of years at school. Um, unlike Maya, I did not go on to become one of the world's greatest writers or a key voice in the civil rights movement. I did win a couple of trampolining certificates, so... <laughs> What's more impressive, yeah, you yeah, decide. Yeah. Um, but just going back to this theme of words, um, you quote her saying, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Can you talk a little bit about the dangers of silence and being silent when you're in pain? Yeah. I mean, nowadays we talk a lot about the mental health conversation and people almost roll their eyes at another celebrity or Meghan Markle or whoever talking about mental health and stuff like that. But I'm actually really grateful that we're in a time where we can actually think of lots of people who, who publicly talk about mental health. I mean, you only have to go back two decades and see a total different picture of silence. Um, certainly, you know, being a young man in 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, when I was really ill, um, the only people I could think of who were famous and mentally ill were suicides. I could think of Hemingway and Plath and Kurt Cobain and Virginia Woolf and, you know, I had that. And so my, the mentality I had because of the culture of silence was of a sort of tragic, romanticised, you know, you're too sensitive of the world kind of attitude, which is just ridiculous but it was understandable because you you people didn't seem to publicly talk about it until relatively recently and i think it's so easy to forget that on social media of how recent the mental health conversation properly is i mean really it's less than a decade i think you know to go back to stephen fry again stephen fry did a documentary um the Secret Life of a Manic Depressive. I think that was like 2007 or something. I, I, for me, I think in this country, that, um, that was, it wasn't just to do with that, but that was the kind of moment I think that was the, the mental health conversation started. started and, and people do talk about it a lot now on social media and stuff. But I think the one thing we have to remember is a lot of people still are very silent um, about it. And, it, you know, away from certain media circles and... Um, certain classes um you know there's a lot of uh a lot of stigma still out there and a lot of self stigma still out there and a lot of people um across genders who uh who feel that it intrinsically harms their identity or their way of thinking about themselves to admit this vulnerability and i was one of those people i was silent for um you know, it seems weird because I, I spend my life blabbering on about it now, but I was silent for 15 years publicly uh, about um, mental health. I, I would do an event like this. I'd come to Edinburgh with one, like my first novel. I can remember I did a small event in Edinburgh in 2005 or something, and I had a panic attack. I was literally having a panic attack on stage. And now, if I was having a panic attack, I would... It'd still be hard and uncomfortable, but I'd tell you I'm having a panic attack, but... You know, you used to have these panic attacks that I used to hide and I couldn't, um, I couldn't deal with. So I, I'd be like having a sort of almost out of body, derealized experience on stage and not be able to say anything about it. And it's so, it's so, um, it feels so liberating to have, to create your own space to be yourself. And mm. it, that definitely is a privilege. It's a privilege as soon as you've got, you know, and I'm a writer, so um, it's almost expected to have, um, mental health issues but there are people who you know have different lines of work or whatever and they feel for whatever reason um, that they're less able to do it and this is why we need to change um, you know education system you know really educate employers because at the moment yes we are getting a lot of um, lip service in terms of people having 
mental health days and mental health first aiders and this, that, and that. But I still think there is a kind of um, cultural stuff deep down that hasn't quite been addressed. And I think, I think the problem is we see mental health as fundamentally different to physical health. And I, I struggle to see where that line is. For me, it's just health. You know, your brain is matter. Your brain is physical. Your brain depends on your nervous system and your stomach, which depends on your whole body. You know, brains are physical. We're physical. Um, I don't really understand why we've got this brick wall between um, physical health and mental health. And I think that's one of the reasons we have still stigma and silence remaining. You know, you think of some physical health conditions, you think of something like, I don't know, a bad back or a um, tinnitus. I've got tinnitus. So I go to the doctor about tinnitus. You know, that's physical and mental at the same time. You know, it's physical. It's a real thing that happens in your ears, but it's also something that is literally worse if you, if you think about it and you mm. tune in on it. And so there's so many things like that, which are, are part physical, part mental. So I think the blurring of the physical and mental and having a more scientifically holistic approach mm. um, to health is, is part of the answer. I mean, we're seeing through this pandemic, the mental and the physical combine so much. You know, yeah. if I get a cold now, that is just a cold that has a mental health dimension on me as a hypochondriac in a way that it never did um, in 2019, you know, uh, you'd yeah. have a cold and you'd have a cold. Now it, now it's an existential crisis every time you <laughs> cough, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, Absolutely. I think it's all into it. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a wonderful passage in your book um, that says, if you're in too much pain to speak, then write, and if you're in too much pain to write, then read. And I would really encourage anyone here or at home, if you haven't read Matt's book, uh, it's just incredible. Um, and now I'm going to um, turn to the audience and uh, I'll do a question from the online audience first. And then if people here want to ask a question, put your hands up and then someone can be ready for you. Um, so this is a question from Jane. Uh, do you think that the pandemic has reduced our resilience and ability to navigate dips in our mental health? And if so, how do we address this collectively? I do think it has. I mean, on the plus side, I do think we're talking about um, mental health more as a result of the pandemic. Um, it's a massive crisis. I mean, even without looking at statistics, which are, are starting to be out there now, um, you know, anecdotally, I, I know in my own extended family, you know, lots of people, especially young people who are having all kinds of crises, which I don't think are being um, adequately, adequately addressed or supported um, by the system, by the NHS, simply because of the infrastructure problems and funding problems. So I think we've, we've got a lot to do um, beyond talking. Um, to sort of fill those gaps, to shorten um, waiting times, waiting lists, to also, um, you know, stop the postcode lottery, which seems to be accentuated um, by the pandemic, about the kind of treatment people get, uh, uh, the kind of services people get, you know, whether you're offered therapy or not offered therapy, should not be dependent on where you live, but it is currently. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've got masses to do. And, I, you know, I particularly worry about um, teenagers, um, young adults. I, I feel like, you know, because this is coming at such a sort of defining moment in their lives, um, the, the sort of thumbprint of this will last a long time and I think, understandably, we haven't come to terms with this impact yet because it's happened in real time in front of us over the last sort of year and a half. But yeah, we've got a lot, a lot to um, do. And I don't have all the answers at all. I can sort of see what the problems are, like a lot of us, but I, I, I don't really um, know what the answers are. But yeah, it's something that needs to be addressed. OK, does anyone in the audience here have a question? Ah, yes, at the front. The conversation today has been absolutely fascinating, and I just 
wanted to expand a little bit and say the the conversation around mental health is really essential, but people who are suffering mental health now are experiencing an, an other thing that people with physical and other disabilities have experienced for a long time. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on how we can reshape society in the wake of the pandemic to give everybody the space they need to express what they need without being judged for asking the, the question or naming what they need. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, I don't know, I think we all need to sort of like have the space and sort of tolerance of each other's um, conditions. And, I, you know, I'm feeling now, you know, talking about, even within mental health, I feel like um, it feels wrong to use the word privilege, but there's a kind of privilege to be able to talk about depression and anxiety, which maybe people who have experience of, um, I don't know, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, self-harm, eating disorders, you know, in those areas, there's still what, masses amounts of stigma. I'm not saying there's no stigma with depression and anxiety, because I think there is in terms of when you actually exhibit symptoms of those things, but at least you can talk about them in a way where it's relatively stigma-free. But I feel like, yeah, there's so many varying degrees and subjective experiences out there. And we do need to be sort of like more open to hearing all those and to, you know, get away from just the sort of centre and, you know, more marginalised um, conditions and um, people and, and, and stuff like that. Um, only caveat to that is, you know, one thing that I really don't like and I do see occasionally online is when you get into a kind of misery Olympics of you know whose whose pain is worst or what conditions were you know people you know people like I've, I've had it before and I, I really have to bite my tongue now because I'm, I'm a little bit more of a sort of public person than I used to be but you know when people sort of talk about depression that you went through that nearly killed you I mean they call it well, your experience of mild depression is to, is that if something kill, nearly kills you, very nearly kills you, it's not mild really. And you know, if you have it for three years and and it's continuous for that time, you know. But I understand the frustration people have because they think, well, their voice is, is not represented and, and stuff like that. So yeah, we absolutely need to open up um, all kinds. And obviously, we've got the tools to do that with social media. But I think the problem with social media is we, uh, it, it can be a very judgmental space very quickly and giving everyone a voice. The, down, the good side of that is it gives everyone a voice, but the downside is that it gives everyone a voice. So <laughs> people who have stigmatizing views or whatever also have that same voice. So um, yeah, again, I, I don't have a solution to that, but you are absolutely right in that we need a sort of like the broadest uh, uh, look at health and um, stigma and all those things and have the space to do it. We're, we're running out of time, so we're going to take a question from the back, and you'll, you'll have to be quite curt and abrupt with this uh, person. <laughs> Hi, thank you for a fascinating talk. Very quickly, then, you talked about the, the, the physicality of the brain and the relationship between the brain and, mm. and, and the body as being key to mental health. How do we think about the integration of the unreal into the real in the past 18 months? For instance, you being on a screen right now. Yeah, well, I, I've... I've been thinking about that a lot recently because I, I suddenly, uh, you know, I, it, I'm not back in a state of panic disorder or anything, but um, there's an interesting, horrible symptom of panic and anxiety called derealization. And derealization, for those that don't know, a lot of you will know, but derealization is where um, the outside world stops to feel real. And throughout this last year and a half, I felt a lot of it has parallels with mental health conditions, you know, in the obvious sense, you've got the sort of compulsive hand washing, you've got the social distancing, you've got the fear of leaving your house. All of that is very, you know, if, if you're prone to anything like agoraphobia or certain, certain strands of OCD, then a lot of that has fed into um, that sort of stuff. But I think, you know, that word derealization, it, it, you know, sometimes just being outside or being in a crowded space or being out in the world again, it, it, it almost doesn't feel 
real. It feels um, very familiar to when I um, used to have agoraphobia and I was getting out, out, out of agoraphobia and coming back into the world again. It feels kind of like that, but the difference is, of course, this time it's been a collective experience, a collective kind of hallucination, like a drink, like what have we just gone through? So I think that's another thing, you know, beyond like, you know, mental illness itself, we, we've all mentally gone through this very strange um, experience. Yes, in different ways and to different degrees, but it, it's been a shared thing to a, to a large extent. And um, yeah, I, I think we don't even, we're not even beginning to understand um, that, but I, you know, as author of a comfort book, I'm trying to be very optimistic <laughs> about things. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's a it's a strange it's a strange thing, but a fascinating thing. I also think, as a fiction writer, because I obviously write fiction as well, it's actually hard to write realistic novels now. It's really hard because I don't want to write a book about um, I don't want to write a pandemic book. I don't even want to write a historical book about the plague or whatever that is. Uh, but actually, writing about reality, I find even if I wanted to write a straightforward, realistic novel now, it, it's very hard to pin down what, that, what, I, what a collective reality is at the moment. So I feel like this sort of like fiction I write where it's sort of one foot in reality, one foot in fantasy, that's actually what reality feels like at the moment. It feels like we're in a kind of speculative um, fiction novel. Will you um, help us finish by reading the absolutely fantastic poem at the end of your book please Matt oh, right I've never I've never read any um of, I've read poetry before but it's never been my own so this is the first time even though it's published in a book which is out there in the world this feels like a little bit um a little bit exposing but anyway yes I will how to be an ocean you haven't failed in a moment of sadness you haven't lost in a moment of defeat you are not a statue standing in an eternal contraposto. You are a thing in motion, a rising tide, a cresting wave. Your vast depths witness every marvel, every wonder. You are then marvelous and wonderful. So don't fight the moon, allow every tide and give all your wrecked ships the spaces to hide. There you go. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Thanks, everyone.